Okay, here we are, the bullish Bitcoin banter and bullshit 4Bs podcast back once again, pod 51. This time it's brought to you by Mr. All In, aka the Trillion Dollar Man, myself, Sir Neverlook, aka the excellence of execution. And it's just the two of us because, unfortunately, Dr. Evil 10%, aka the People's Champ, is away. And Mrs. No Show, surprise, surprise. No Show. <laughs> no show you got it you got it but uh yeah here we are 51 and counting what's going on yeah we are indeed yeah it should be probably one of our short shows i would reckon uh based on what we've got i've got a few little stories but i've been away and majority of where i was was on a stag do and the story that i came away with was a fair few people on there knew i was a bitcoiner uh, so a conversation came up about it and unfortunately it was just full of no coiners that had a bit of either FUD or just didn't really have any interest and only pe- two people did have some interest and they were right into their shit coins and, and NFT yeah. and uh like yeah, full I, on shit coins yeah full on and they, they both actually admitted that they had never owned a bitcoin not not hold it now they have never owned any they went they, they've got this full straight down into the but they've, they're almost beyond shit coins they're just into jpegs on the blockchain and you could see in their eyes and they were talking about it and i was going why do you think these things have value like, oh, at some point in the metaverse that da, da, da. i'm like how far away do you think that is and which metaverse like who's building it which one mm. like, listing various nft projects and in reality, when we really distilled it down, I think they realized their arguments fell down quite quick and just went that we're doing it for the gains. We just want to make money. And uh, we just go, well, it's, it's okay, but what do, you, what do you really value at the end of it? And it, they, they valued fiat. And, and that's, yeah. that's kind of what it all comes down to, really, is that you, you f- they think they're in the same space as us, but they're just not. They're, they're, in, the, they're in the casino. Uh, I tried to relate it back to like the Grand National, you know, it's like just that, that punt that I put on, what, what was it? Noble Yeet, should, should never forget that name. No. Um, it was £10 each way, which it was just a throwaway bet. You know, I fully expected it to lose. And then it won. I'm like, oh my God, I've got £800 of money that I did not think I was ever going to see again. Um, and that's what they're doing on NFTs. It's about the level of research that they did. I like the name. They, it's the same pick of the, what they're doing on the NFTs. It's like, I, I like the name and it, I like the picture a little bit. And um, but they're not just betting 10 pounds each way. They they started like that. They start, they said they started on 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pound NFTs. But now they've built up a bit of a portfolio and they're spending thousands on it. Wow. Um, you could see in their eyes, they were like, I was like, you've got like life-changing money now in these JPEGs. Are you going to exit or whatever? And they're like, but what if it 10x is? I don't want to miss out on the on a 10x. Go, but what if it goes to zero? Like do you really think someone is going to buy those pictures off you for 10x the price yeah. going, maybe you don't know they're not going to I'm like, i was like okay boys boys you're you, you've done well this is the classic kind of gambler's fallacy where yeah you come in you don't really know what you're doing but you make some money it'd be like me thinking i know how what horse racing now so i take my 800 pounds set fire to that pretty quick and then start plowing in thousands of my own money thinking no i'm a professional gambler now it, this is a matter of time to make money and really i got lucky once lost that money and now i'm too deep in to kind of admit that i didn't know what i was doing at all i think that's where they are on the nfts it's just disappointing that they're, they're, they're the younger generation coming in through as well and another funny thing right this lad i reckon he had he didn't exactly say how much but he alluded i think he has a 10 or 20k worth of nfts this guy is 33 and still lives at home with his parents oh gosh and i just uh... went that's that's exactly who I think would own NFTs because they yes. made so many bad decisions to be in that position, right? And you know, yeah. no, no shame on living at home or whatever. But let's just say, like, why are you investing in that type of shit? You're such a degenerate. And you've actually managed to get, say, 20, 30K. You've built that up yeah. in a small bankroll. That is your opportunity to freaking go and stand on your own team feet. He's not, he's still rolling the dice. And I can guarantee he's going to be 43 instead of those living at home and we'll have yeah. less than he has now probably because his, his jpegs will go to zero 
it's so funny you talk about this because as you know before we were talking off air and the uh the podcast that i was listening to was from the investing podcast which was once uh basically uh the all about Warren Buffett basically but prior to what it was before but um it was an interview uh with Brian Feraldi and uh and his book why do stocks always go up mm-hmm. but he was actually talking about why people stay away from the stock market and because they stay away from it because in their mind it's actually a casino it's gambling yeah and so a lot of people just say no we're not going to do anything with regards to that I'm just going to leave it. But those that do get involved, the level of research that they actually do is pretty much near to zero. And I'm sure very much so, like these guys in the NFTs, it's very much zero. They don't understand anything behind it. And it's just a hope in terms of why the stock may go up or the NFT in their case may go up. Whereas, you know, we can proudly sit here and talk about the hundreds of hours invested in Bitcoin through the podcast, you know, it's hard evidence. In fact, majority of these are all two hours plus long. But then all of the research that we do in our own spare time and how we, you know, carry on you know, talking about it offline as well you know, to many of the viewers. So this is, you know, we ask about how each other are, but we're also just talking about Bitcoin in between these, uh, these week long shows as well. But I think the main thing that came across from the beginning of uh, from what I've heard from that podcast is all about the education. It's about the education of financial advice and understanding, um, you know, ultimately what money is, what the stock market is, whether it's what Bitcoin is. and, And I think that's really, really key as well in terms of you know getting people to understand yeah i think that the trick to it really is in my head anyway the way i've simplified it for myself is the stock market is a bit of a casino and it is extremely corrupt but what it does do is it's where the rich and the elite put their money so yeah. essentially it it tends to outperform inflation so the easiest way just to to play that game is just to not even try and beat it just join the game just join the yeah, game exactly and just put exactly. your money in the s p 500 or put it yeah. in amazon or google or whatever and it'll just keep it'll, it'll just keep its value um the, the problem is most people aren't satisfied doing that they think that's too boring and too safe and they want to turn a thousand pound into a million and that's when you just lose the thousand it's like well yeah that Warren Buffett doesn't try and do that. And he's, he claims to be the best investor ever. He, he will put money in something and then leave it there for 50 years. That's the trick. It's just putting it in, tracking the market and then being super patient. Mm. And, um, but yeah, no one gets taught how to do that. And then the, the only added complication is we now have Bitcoin as well. So that is where there was actually a way of beating <laughs> the system for the first time ever. And we think we're yeah. going to win. So just tracking inflation in the stock market isn't actually going to cut it probably over the next decade because at some point the music going to stop and the value of those stocks that all denominated in dollars are going to get hit pretty freaking hard and a load yeah. of wealth is going to go scoring into bitcoin so that's it but it really if you listen to this pod and you're um kind of fairly well read around money and investing then it is still quite an easy strategy really it's like personally i think it's a nice allocation of stocks and bitcoin and it's just all about how confident are you in Bitcoin, depending on the percentage? So for like someone like me, it's pretty much 98% is Bitcoin and I have 2% of stocks, which it kind of, um, they almost like role play as my wallet. It's my bank account. Yeah. I keep it in stocks and then I sell some stocks each time. I need some money for my day to day and that's how I run my life. But I'd imagine most people would start the other way around and do 2% Bitcoin, 98% probably cash in stocks. And gradually, as you get more confident, you you just raise up the percentages. And I don't think anyone would really reverse because over if you provide your patient, just look on the, the history of the stock market the last hundred years. It's it's up only, and that's because of inflation. It isn't anything clever. It's no, you don't need to be a stockbroker to know that. It's just they print more money, so the money's worth less. The companies are worth more. It's just basic maths. Yeah. 
Definitely. Well, this is the thing as well. I think from uh, Morgan Housel's book, which is a fantastic classic, The Psychology of Money, it's exactly that. It's having the temperament not to want to actually gamble and just be like, right, I know what I know. These stocks are good or Bitcoin's fantastic. I just need to settle on that path and not do anything more. And that's the hard part. People always feel like they need to be doing something because that's what they've seen in the films. That's what they do there. You know, they they buy and they sell. Well, no, if you buy and you sell, you're actually uh, activating and get a taxable event and so forth. And, and, and actually you want to hold, you want to buy and hold because for the long run, you will then start to see the multiples over the course of time. You, you sell, then uh, there's actually a statistic that, you know, where people say, oh, I'll just put cash on the side and then I'll wait for, to buy the dip. Well, even that is, is just the wrong thing to do because you will have outperformed, I think it's like, I think it's like something ridiculous, like 13% is the uh, the percentage of you outperforming by waiting for the dip. So, you know, you've got a 13% chance that you're going to outperform. So on the other side of it, you've got 87% chance of just get in, hold and buy and just and just ride the wave that way. Yeah. So it's uh, much smarter, of course. Yeah. What was the famous quote? The famous quote is don't time the market. Well, time in the market beats time in the market. Don't I think it's something like over the last 20 years, it's like the, the most important days where most of the gains came from in the entire SP 500 was like 15 days over 20 years. So yeah. just, you just missed like a couple of these days. These are big, like 20, 30% swings. And then they, they only happen 15 times in 20 years. So it's less than one a year. So if you think you can predict these things, then then good luck. But they're pretty much unpredictable. They don't really have any rhyme or reason as to why these things, these 15 days happened. But mm -hmm. pretty, pretty much like if you missed something like five of those days, then you were behind inflation. So yeah. it's just just sit in the market and yeah, you're gonna you're gonna take 20, 30% drawdowns, but you just gotta wait it out and the market recovers and then pushes on through. If you try yeah. and go, oh, I'm gonna exit now, chances are you're probably gonna sell halfway down it's going to go even lower you'll probably then sell again thinking oh i'm panicking I want to get out and buy really the bottom and then before you know it you get a 30 percent uptick and you're buying the same stocks for 30 percent more and that wasn't a buy the dip moment was it no it's just human no. psychology will always play you so by the way these dips will always happen so it's probably worthwhile saying that the dip will happen but it's just how low that dip will go to make you actually think well was it worth the wait and not actually being again to your point in the market as well and this is what we always say to non-coiners or shit coiners just get in the market and the market we're talking about is bitcoin of course you don't need to have a whole coin at all just get off zero and um you know i was again speaking offline i think i've uh, finally orange pilled my seven-year-old so uh his his first book on bitcoin will be arriving tomorrow and uh yeah he's all about it and he gets it you know he gets uh digital currencies in the fact that he plays roblox and he buys robux but robux doesn't give him anything but zero yeah it gives him in-game cash but ultimately he wants that cash to go up he's already got and i don't know why but you know a desire to want to live in a mansion and drive lamborghinis and i'm like okay yeah that's great but you hate school and uh, you're not really, <laughs> you know what I can say, you know, you're not really Einstein because I'm your dad. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know how you're going to do this, son, but hey, maybe if we do invest in a little bit of Bitcoin, then yeah, the Lambos can get them in every colour for every day of the week if we carry on on the right path. Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah. Just think how far advanced he will be, like more than me and you, if yeah. he understands what money is by the time he's 18. Like he exactly. is already 10 years ahead of me. It took me 10 years to figure that out. Yeah. He gets that. And literally the advice we just talked through there, like the money he earns, just get it into Bitcoin and track the SMP. He's already better off. Like I, most of my money rotted in just that in bank accounts. And um, I just, and, and died. And bars. Yeah. 
a lot of money and wasted and <laughs> yeah. yeah which i guess you have to do when you're young to a certain absolutely but at the same time like and because in reality i was one of the people we were just talking about like i didn't know what else i didn't know yeah. there was an option I, I knew i should save and i was saving bits but it was just rotting i, I didn't know how to invest i was scared i, I thought you know, i was just going to get lose my money and then it wasn't until i was much older so i think just giving our kids the the grounding of what money is and how to invest mm. they can choose whether they want to do it or not or maybe they want to outsource it to us and we look after a little bit of their money or whatever but i yeah. think we can really you really can dumb it down enough where bitcoin is super easy stocks are super easy and it's it's more the, or the the low time preference and the discipline they're the kind of get i think we can do a lot of games with kids you know the the classic marshmallow kind of experiment but more real life yeah. ones around money you know like you can have your your five pound pocket money today or you can wait to the end of the month and i'll give you 30 and if you do the maths on that there's an extra 10 pounds in there yeah are you gonna wait and get something big for 20 pounds or do you want the fiver now and obviously pay it in sats or whatever and then you know if he wants to buy something you transfer the sats to me and i'll i'll convert do the currency for conversion into fiat and buy the thing over here yeah. and um and yeah, if it's it super smart, you might take today's price instead of waiting to the end of the month's price as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, as we say, more time in the market, or you might want to have dollar cost average in. That would be even a good little element of risk, isn't it? It's like you're going to yeah. gamble that Bitcoin isn't going to go up by more than, what would that be, about 30% this month? And you might go, hmm, I don't know. Like, I, I, I'll, I'll take the fiver now because it might be worth 20 by the time the end of the month comes. So exactly. you might actually play them, have a little experiment and gamble. But he's kind of gambling yeah. pocket money as opposed to later in life where he's gambling thousands when he should be paying his rent and moving out of your house. <laughs> so. Absolutely. So interesting because with the girl earlier on as well, uh, I said, like, we, we've always had this conversation of um, what do you want to do when you're older? And, uh, and she says, oh, I don't know. Well, she, she actually did say she, she doesn't know. She says she wants to sleep. <laughs> she says she wants to sleep and eat. And it's like, oh, that's great. Well, you can do that. But you either need one of two things. You either need to be in education or you need to have a job. And she's just like, oh, right. OK. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, we're all on it. And um, I think she will also have the a very good temperament of being a Bitcoiner because she already gets the uh, delayed gratification. Like anything in terms of food wise, it's whatever's the best thing on the plate will be the thing that's eaten last. And that's just a natural thing that she's always done. So, uh, I yeah, I think we've, we've got some Bitcoiners in the house. Yeah, I never got the people that ate the best thing first and saved the, the worst to last. I always used to save the best thing to last as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a little bit of a like hidden marshmallow experiment, that. Yeah, yeah. Because it's because there's a risk, isn't there? It's like you're delaying the best gratification for last, but you're building up to it. Mm. It's a little bit of an investor's mentality. So, yeah, it could be a, a good sign. One thing, though, I think she sometimes takes it too far. Like when uh, she, let's say we we'll go to McDonald's and she'll take the like the drink and she'll she'll leave it. And she'll be like, "Oh, I'll have it the next day." And I'm like, "Yeah, but that'll <laughs> actually go flat. <laughs> like the drink will go flat. Like it's no good." And, and she's just like, "No, no, no, I'll leave it." And I'm like, oh, "Okay." And then she ends up throwing it away. I'm like, "I told you." So sometimes you need to take those opportunities when you've got them. Cash out. Yeah, she, she's. It's, it's a better mentality than the most kids they would just yeah. buy everything be sick and then ask you to buy more <laughs> so <laughs> i think she's on the right path it sounds like she's going to that one for sure you want to move on to your first article of the week yeah yeah so uh, so the first article it's a it's behind a paywall um but Everything that he ever talks about, I immediately just simply like. A lot of the time I see it on uh, LinkedIn, and that is Nick Bataille, the author of Laid Money, which is a great book, which is definitely, you know, out of all the, the Bitcoin books that are out there, one that I I recommend naturally with the Bitcoin standard and, you know, uh, the price of tomorrow, which isn't necessarily a Bitcoin per se book, but certainly all the fingers point towards Bitcoin, which is in the last chapter. So um, in this article um, from 
Nick Bataille in uh, from his uh, the the Bitcoin layer, which is his article uh, monthly article, I think it is to his readers. He's talking about Bitcoin versus, in quotes, the dollar, but not just against the dollar, but just simply in terms of different asset classes and uh, and looking at Bitcoin as an asset class. Now, I won't go through all of the various different asset classes, but, you know, we've got one that we're seeing erode right in front of our eyes, which is the bond market was once upon a time one of the safest asset classes that are around. Um, for those that don't know, let's say you put your money in bonds, it's a guaranteed return with a little bit extra on top. But those are no good at this moment in time. And I think that we're going to see a big influx if we haven't already in terms of money that was once put into the bond market, now into Bitcoin as people move away and diversify outside of it. It was a, a very you know, boomer centric asset class in terms of bonds. But uh, there's also things that are revenue producing assets like property, which you know I'm a fan of in terms of this. But Bitcoin as an asset class versus the dollar is an interesting one because the dollar, as we know, is going to zero, whereas Bitcoin, the only way is up based on gamification and the fact that it's going to become a scarce asset and is the hardest money known to man. Uh, but in this article, it talks about fractional reserve banking and also uh, how Essentially, banks can create money, whereas you cannot create more Bitcoins. So what did you think about the article, uh, Mr. Orlin? Yeah, I, I liked it. Yeah, I, I don't pay for his posts, unfortunately. So I don't really know like the crux of probably like the golden nugget that he's probably got in here. It's not quite on the free bit, but there's enough <laughs> here to see it. Yeah, and, uh, it's it's an interesting argument, right? Because he's basically going, let's not compare Bitcoin against the dollar. Uh, it's all about comparing Bitcoin against credit. And therefore, um, how do you compete against credit? And, and I think it is interesting because we, do, we don't really have credit in Bitcoin, but we can create credit and bank type institutions around Bitcoin. And I suspect it will be happening as well, where... You know, we are going to get to a point where we do our fractional reserve lending on Bitcoin because it's, it's, it's only going to happen. But then like how Nick points out here, we will know when that is happening um, because mm. we'll be able to check it on the blockchain because more Bitcoin essentially we will be created. You know, the, an exchange might only have, let's just say 10,000 Bitcoin, but if they've lent out 15,000, then we know 15, five of those thousand are not backed by anything. That's just paper Bitcoin that is on top. And if all the people that are owed that Bitcoin request it, they're going to be short. And that's exactly yeah. the trouble that the banks got in where they weren't just loaning out 15 and only had 10. I think it, at one point they were doing 10 to one on every dollar they had. So that's an example of having basically 10,000 Bitcoin, but lending out 100,000. And then guess what? The people that were owed that money called it in. And trying mm. to draw the money and they didn't have it and it's when that was where nearly every financial crisis we've had in the history of banks all, all kind of comes from it's technically it tends to become from largely fractional bank reserve banking and the fact that they they are gambling the money behind the scenes and not really telling the, their consumers but I, I still think it's going to happen in bitcoin i i do uh I, because people will create paper bitcoin and there's always yeah. going to be a demand for credit and as much as we always talk about low time preference, you know, not many people are going to save up all the money to buy a house and buy it in one go. So to do that on a Bitcoin standard, we are going to see people going, look, I'm not good for the whole value of the house right now, but I can pay a deposit plus I need to loan some out over. I think we'll get shorter time periods of mortgages. And I think house prices could well come back down to more closely in line with what wages are and they'll and house prices will, will mean more stagnant so will salary and wages because we won't have the type of inflation that we have today so we don't need all these things to continually go up it's, it'll be nice just to live in a world it's like oh i haven't had a pay rise for 20 years it's like yeah it doesn't matter though because the price of mm. living hasn't gone up and um 
but yeah, well, I think we'll still get to, so I think it will come back down. And what I would probably like to see is almost a return to how our grandparents had it, where you, you do get a mortgage, but it's a mortgage and it's more like a loan really. Um, and it's the equivalent of say, uh, say two or three years worth of salary spread over like seven to 10 years. And that's what, that's the loan you take out on some Bitcoin allocation and you, you work over that 10 years. And at the end you have a, you have a nice family home and, and that would be a nice place where the average person can do that. Basically you pay their mortgage off within 10 years. So then you, then you're free to do what you want pretty much. And, and it kind of gives you your time back. It gives you your freedom. As opposed to being tied to paying this huge debt, which really the bank never want you to pay off anyway. No, and, yeah, and, and, and the government don't want you to pay it off either because they want you in the system being productive, yeah. kind of cleaning floors, serving takeaways um, and paying tax back into the system. And, you know, you're, you're earning good money, but, you know, as we know, you know, depending on how much you earn, anything from 20 to 70 percent of every pound you earn ends up back in the government coffers in some shape or form, either directly through taxes from earning or various import price of goods taxes whatever you whatever you want it's just it's just going out left right and center and it all ends up back at the government so you, you really are earning less money so hopefully on a bitcoin standard not only do you keep more of the money that you earn because governments won't be taking so much of it but um you also won't be getting hit by inflation and because mm. that's the biggest problem people got right now right it's, um they've kind of come to terms with how much money they earn but the biggest issue is every year the money that they've allocated and budgeted is going down and down and down in value through no fault of their own, which is why, you know, we've had stories on, on here before, which is, you know, the famous people that are, teach how, how people to find discounts and how to manage your money, how to cut savings. They've even given up at this point going, <laughs> yeah, we can't keep cutting costs because in reality, it isn't the people that have got the problem anymore. It's actually the government and the banks that are just accelerating this problem out of control so I think we're going to be getting to this point quite quick. And this is what we need to do in Bitcoin, really. We need to build a, essentially quite a robust, mature financial system around Bitcoin, around a Bitcoin standard, because we, we, we won't be able to go to bit hyper Bitcoinization without essentially a bit of a replacement for these type of banking services globally. We don't just need wallets. We do need credit. And um, I don't think we're quite there yet. We, we need to do more on this. Well, uh, just to your point about maybe not taking as large a loan or taking a loan and then uh, paying it off over two to three years and then actually living your life, I think we may eventually get there. But before we get there, we're going to go through some real crisis. And uh, and you can already see this crisis through the, the amount of buy now, pay later companies that have popped up and... You know, essentially, you can wrap up in whatever wrapper that you want, but it's still debt. And people have taken on that debt that they believe that they can afford. But as prices of everything else go up and up and up, that debt is going to become harder and harder to pay back. And it's going to leave people short. And that's where defaults and naturally going to happen and that's where we are and I, I've, I can already kind of see it and sense it knowing a lot more and kind of just being a, a lot more observant in the market that we are going to see another crash you know we're, we're talking we're seeing people talk about food shortages and you know there's there being a food crisis already they are I don't even think that they are well, of course, they're going to scaremonger a little bit, but they're talking about obviously the price of fuel in terms of electric and gas going up in October as well. So if people have already felt the pinch of what's coming, of it going up a further 50%, fuel prices are already at their all-time highs. When it goes up even further on top of this all-time high of gas and electric, People have got to make choices of whether we heat or eat on top of everything else. Yeah, Talk, talking about eating, I was on Just Eat the other day. And do you know, you can pay with Klarna on Just Eat. You, <laughs> I heard it was coming. I think we said this, like, yeah. Yeah, we, it's insane. 
Right. Then that is that is just so predatory, right? And I think this is the perfect example of a crash, right? It's it's really disgusting when you see the most deprived areas and the poorest areas, at least in the UK. If you go down the high street, what do you see? Uh, and you see cheap bars, you see yeah. gambling shops, pound shops, um, and and the banks will still be there on the high street. And uh, so essentially, all those places none of them are good right so the cheap yeah. bars are just selling cheap alcohol cheap food not going to be nutritious not going to be good for you in any way gambling shops and pound shops and um they're all just because basically most of the people that the little money they have they'll spend that on alcohol or gambling and then the little bit of money they have left over they have to then buy their entire week shopping on like three pound in the pound shop right and they'll again yeah. eat, eat largely dirt from that and then now you've got in the takeaways and obviously if you're buying a takeaway and you can't, don't have the money, you should not be buying it. So the fact there was a button there that says, just put it on the never, never. <laughs> and I think I looked at the percentages. It was like something like 17% right, every three days or something. It was going up. I'm like, this is, this, this is, yeah. And, and It builds a culture, doesn't it? Because you might um, already conjuring the images of, oh, well, let's just have a takeaway the day before payday. You know, yeah. let's treat ourselves. But then when payday comes and you've already limited on money, but then a couple of days after the percentage goes up and then that treat becomes a liability. Oh my gosh, so takeaways become a liability because we don't have the discipline within it, within ourselves to just simply say, you know what, let's cook or let's not buy this and let's get something else to eat. Oh, yeah, but it's so easy, isn't it? And you can just see the spiral that it leads down. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and desperate people do desperate things, right? Because it's, it's it's their only enjoyment of the week, right? So a bit yeah. of alcohol, a bit of a, ba- a gamble and a takeaway. So you can see why people are doing it. I don't even particularly blame them. Like, they haven't been educated and they haven't really got a way out. So what, what more can you actually spend? The little bit of money you do have left. A takeaway, yeah. a bet on the horses or four couple of pints you know and it's their one enjoyment the problem is it just compounds a problem they're not getting out they're getting further in and um mm. again we, we had a question about regulation and stuff and we talked about it last week and i'll go but if regulation works then this wouldn't be happening right you wouldn't allow people to go after the poorest like this and um, you wouldn't you wouldn't allow people to take out a loan for for takeaway that that is one thing that i would actually say regulation should ban that you know it should yeah be, you only got the cash in the bank you ain't, you ain't having the takeaway it's simple as that yeah um and and this gets unfortunately people further and further away from uh from bitcoin as well unfortunately yeah because they will just see it as (laughs) i sometimes liken it when i go on holiday and to people see us maybe you know from western land coming to their country as them going to the moon and what i mean is like like we might not ever travel to the moon one day people have of course and it may become a a thing that the the elites do as you know their 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 getaway we, but, we have allegedly been on the moon i won't go there <laughs> we have allegedly indeed um, but, you know, when, when I ask somebody from another country, oh, have you ever been to the UK before? They look at me like I've had, like, like I've got three heads or so, like, what? You know, we, 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 we've never even left the island or the country. I don't own a passport. You know, what we're talking about here to some others about saving, about you know, making a future for themselves, Bitcoin essentially being the answer to a lot of these issues and problems, they're so far removed from it. Yeah, I know. It's it's why when I whenever we talk to people from kind of rich European countries or America, this whole concept of governments can fail and the money can fail and not just like our version of failure, which is like our, our prime minister having a little birthday party during lockdown. And everyone is up in arms about it. It's just, I just cringe at how pathetic we are in this country about what the dramas are and why we think yeah. our leaders should step down for stuff like that. You go, 
no like let's let's hold them account for the real stuff you know inflation you know, a, 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 their corruptness around allow, allowing the banks to do whatever they want with the money and bailing them out and locking us down forcing us to, to take an untested vaccine like there's a million things that we could hang draw and quarter these guys on yeah mm. obsessed with a birthday party and when i try and like bring the attention back to the big stuff they they fundamentally go look it, it doesn't really matter because it hasn't gone wrong i don't feel the hurt from it really and you go that's just because you come from a rich country that hasn't failed for 50 years but mm. go go into an eastern european or a poor european or an african country or a south american country and tell them that oh maybe the currency could fail and the government can steal all the money and they'll look at you and go yeah it happened last week like and and four times the year before you know and they'll go of course they can do that and you go there's this cognitive dissonance that we have about no but we're different because we're the great britain you know we've got the word great before our names like such yeah. so egomaniacs just can't, won't happen here it's like because we're british like oh my it, it's gonna happen and it's gonna happen hard you know what so many people tried to warn you you almost deserve it now when it comes mm. it is so funny you say it as well because you're absolutely right people just simply say it can't happen here. And, uh, you know, the war with Russia and Ukraine, I, I keep on saying to, to friends and family, like, be careful. Like, this is what's happened there can happen here. And, uh, and you know, we always say it, don't we? It, it's funny until it happens to you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, talking about cognitive, cognitive dissidents, to move on mm. to wikipedia who yeah. clearly have some weird woke reservations around the world. <laughs> and um so they've they've since um well they put a big proposal together they voted on a proposal to stop accepting crypto uh, i you hate that word but we're just going to call it yeah. bitcoin they received over one hundred thirty thousand dollars last year in bitcoin revenue but they, they make 150 million in total revenue so it's it's 0.1% and then um, they put a proposal yeah. forward going that is bad for the env environment it's also a risky investment that we don't want to encourage our users to do so let's just remove our support for it and so far that proposal it's not gone through but I thought was it isn't like 200 people voted for it 232 voted for yeah 94 voted against so so far it's it's basically passed they haven't done it yet but it's just, it's just silly. It's and this is where the the FUD can take hold, right? These people are supposed to verify the information, right? They're literally the Wikipedia guys, you know, the writing articles and making sure everything's got a source and it isn't opinion. Yeah, mm. they are dismissing Bitcoin for literally the exact thing that they are great at ironing out, which is going, okay, you say Bitcoin's bad for the environment, right? Can you cite that source, please, and tell me why? And very quickly you would realize oh no it uses energy but nothing in in the grand scheme of things and actually is predominantly green energy da, da, da. they have not done that and they've just acted emotionally and gone i just we just don't like it really it's basically an opinion and i've tried to remove it and it just is very anti wikipedia in my opinion like this whole move yeah and it goes to show isn't it that you know whilst we think that wikipedia is quite independent it's a it's a source of the people and of course people have the ability to go in and edit it and naturally it is then being backed up by what is supposed to be independent fact checkers they're just not doing their job because if they knew anything about anything, they'd be tuning into the four Bs and just pod 50 of last week, we covered this in terms of the facts of uh, how much energy Bitcoin actually uses as well. And so, uh, you know, maybe we should, we should send them the link <laughs> to, uh, to Chris Larson's change the code campaign where it actually talks about the block size wars and uh, how much energy Bitcoin uses in comparison to a lot of other things that are out there, including tumble dryers in the US. Yeah, I've been using that one loads. It's, it's brilliant. It's, you know, it's just so easy, so relatable as well for people to actually understand. Certainly when you see the, the big two of aviation and uh, 
and, and shipping was it that was in there as number two or something. So, um, you know, yeah. And, and, and reality, if anyone really cared, it, what is it? It's out of all the emissions, does the top 100 companies yeah. are responsible for 70% of the emissions in total. So if you, if you really are a big government, you want a big concerted global effort to reduce emissions, you would obviously start with the top 100 companies and you'd, you would pay them a shit ton of money to convert to whatever forms of energy are flavor of the week, right? And just mm. convert, save the planet, right? We're saving the planet if this is really what it's about. Start there. Why are they starting yeah. with the plebs? Go in, eat the bugs and stop going on holiday. How about you start with the top 100 companies and... And, and most of it is in China, right? And they're completely off the record, off the kind of map. They don't give a shit yeah. about carbon credits or anything. So no matter what we did, you could make every single person on the planet not in China um, adhere to all these things, which I still don't think would actually reduce emissions because no matter what you do, you are burning energy, right? Humans want yeah. to burn energy to live. We, we have to. It's literally our bodies burn energy. You know, it's literally our... You, you missed the pun there about they're off the grid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so even if everyone agreed that they technically have control over, um, well, Russia and China, both two fingers yeah. up all this, they are responsible for the majority of it. Um, so it's, it's just, it's so much virtue signaling, but I guess we're in a world of virtue signaling and um, they, 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 and they love it. And I think they just feel good because, because reality, I think really what it is driven by is, there's a hatred for Bitcoin because a lot of people at this point have seen it and then dismissed it and the price has gone up a lot. So now mm. they now have this resentment for having a missed opportunity. Now they just don't want to be wrong. So they cling on to, oh yeah, I didn't invest in it because I am a good person and I care about the planet. That's why I didn't buy it. And I never will. You go, well, keep holding on to that happy reason because it's not true. And eventually you're going to be buying Bitcoin in at a hundred times the price that it is today. It's funny, isn't it? There's kind of a couple of flavors of this type of person because you've got either the the planet lovers or you've got the gold bugs as well who kind of get it but then don't get it uh, and therefore because they've missed it they're like no don't want to get it and too stubborn to have the intellectual humility to kind of make a turnaround and say actually yeah I once used to dismiss Bitcoin but then I did a little bit of research into it and came back actually and thought yeah right let's do it you know I always think about this when I think about uh, our man Michael Saylor you know he knew about Bitcoin from early doors and dismissed it and then kind of thought actually I need to need to go back yeah, the funny thing was, even when he got reminded about that, he'd forgotten he dismissed it. It was <laughs> like a passing comment that he just, I mean, it was two tweets. Because I remember when he first bought his, it's like the 100 million or maybe a billion, I can't remember, a huge amount of Bitcoin anyway. And everyone's like, who the hell is this micro strategy? And Mike, Michael Saylor. So the first thing we did, you know, don't trust, verify. Yeah, when, that's like, when has he talked about Bitcoin before? And we found these tweets of him slamming it. So straight away, everyone got on him and went, we don't trust you. What are you doing? You bought a load of Bitcoin. You're clearly going to dump it soon. It's just an yeah. investment fee. You don't understand the asset because look, here's these three tweets. And he pretty much just held his hands up and went, okay, I, I obviously said that. I don't really remember saying it, but I was wrong. <laughs> and he went, I want to go on some podcasts. Where should I go? And then that was this, <laughs> that was the spawn of Michael Sayer because holy fuck, were we wrong? Like we, the, the information we had to verify was a limited sample size and he had learned a lot in that time and he had admitted and he came online and went you know what you were right to slam me but i have learned and this is what i've learned bitcoin is the next global currency of the globe you're like all right all right sailor you can stick around i think you've uh, yeah you've progressed he's earned his spot definitely but um yeah we're talking about twitter yeah on the thing again because obviously we love bitcoin twitter and um right. I mean, we we covered the story that Elon bought 10% or essentially like 9.8 or something. But now he's gone for he's gone for the 100 and he's put he in wants a, the whole hog, right? He's not coming in to play games. He wants the whole hog and all in. All in. <laughs> all in. Now, what does a an Elon Twitter look like? 
right? You know, does he continue to build upon what it is today and obviously make it better? Does he introduce Doge for some strange reason and, you know, try to prove to the world that Doge is actually, uh, you know, kind of relevant? Hopefully not. Or does he go down the other path that actually, you know, being a full Bitcoiner and leaving that people don't get that he's just clowning people that still buy Dogecoin. Yeah, well, um, I watched a little... But they're still kind of piling their money and thinking that he's being serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it, it is sad. The Dogecoin thing is very, very worrying. Um I don't think he, he has any plans on that, but I, I would not be surprised if he did integrate Doge. It would just won't have any usage. It's not, as we know, it's, it's not, it doesn't matter if he does. If you can put Doge everywhere, it's still just owned by two guys. They're going to exit scam and dump the price and everyone's going to run off um, having lost all their money. Um, but I did watch a, a video with him. He actually did a TED Talk um, about three days ago. It's online. It's worth watching. That's right. I saw it, yeah. yeah, yeah, saw it. Yeah, yeah, I'm all over it. So he was talking, I forgot the name of the guy, but just uh, in terms of the factory, right? Just before the day of the opening of his factory. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it's the, the day before. Yeah. Cool. You're, you're, uh, I think your internet just cut out and froze for a sec. It's all good. You're back. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, what I, so, I think yeah. Is- so on, on that interview, he talked a lot about, uh, or he was reminded about the things that he said in the past mm. about where they are now, of course, and then where he thinks about the future 10, 20, 30 years from now. And I think this is an interesting one as well, because um, I think we touched on it last week where you know, Bitcoin is still so young right now in terms of uh, where we are. And you mentioned earlier on about using your Bitcoin as credit as well. So, you know, there is things like, uh, I think it's Celsius Network, where you can give your Bitcoin to them and they hold it, obviously, securely. And then you can make a, uh, a, 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 no, sorry, What's the word? You can make interest on your Bitcoin at like six, seven, eight percent as well. Yeah, um, it's a massive shitcoin exchange, isn't it? It's yeah, it's all powered by shitcoin. Yeah, we, we need Bitcoin yeah. only versions, ideally. That's it. But these these things will evolve essentially. Uh, you know, they kind of sometimes need to have these shit versions to get to the good version. Uh, because it's just natural iteration, isn't it? Ultimately, yeah. But um, yeah, but listening to Elon on there, it did sound encouraging. Uh, although I'd rather probably have even more free speech than he was saying. He basically went, it would be he would follow the laws of the land on what free speech is, and then he got pushed, didn't he? Going, there's there's different types of hate speech around, you know, what you say to an individual because you could just say, I hate spinach. You know, so that's hate speech, but no one's really going to jump to the defense of spinach and go, how dare you say you hate it? Then you can go, okay, well, I hate this person. Now, that is still technically hate speech, but should that be illegal? Should it be censored? Probably not. Most people would say not. Then you can go, I hate this person, and I wish they weren't alive. Now you can go, oh, okay, now there's probably, probably a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of people might call that a death threat or something. So some people are saying no now. And then they said, say the same thing again, but have a picture with uh, an arrow on the guy's head. So that is very much, you know, now clearly, you know, kind of a, a bit of a death threat attempt. And you go, so some people now would say that is to now not happen. But there's plenty of people, and um, like for me, can, for example, would say, just go, go at it all, all the way. Um, just Because the second you start censoring, it's a horrible murky line of now yeah. going, you're bringing subjectivity into it. Um, yep. A human being has to make that call because as we just went through those five examples, which are really good by the interviewer, if you get a thousand people and go, well, where's the hate speech start and where does it be, like, or where's it start and finish, everyone's going to draw the line at a different point. And that's just yeah. five little basic tweets that are made up. Now compare it to the billions of people on the planet all having to go at each other and arguing constantly. 
And without you realizing it, what you end up doing is human bias will come in and go, right, this person is being hateful, but I do I like the person? If I like the person they're being hateful at, I'm more likely to censor that. If I dislike the person they're being hateful towards, then I'm more likely to let it go. So you you can't really Mm. stop those human biases ever coming in the second you start censorship. Is why ultimately what we need is a platform that is completely built over the top of Bitcoin and is totally censorship resistant and can't be censored at all because there's no individual that can stop anything and we just use it. And you, you, you could like potentially like still have the ability to block, to hide, to have a private network within there. So if a certain type of speech was happening and you don't like it, fine. You know, just keep keep yourself in a little echo chamber if you want. But for people like me that wants to hear everything, then I uh, then I will just go out there and no matter the worst of the worst, it's like, you know, if someone just spews out hate all day, um, is racist or anti-Semitic or sexist, whatever it might be, well, guess what? That's not going to get very many followers. That's not very interesting. Mm. I, I want to hear like clever Bitcoin um, kind of conversations where we attack ideas, not individuals. And the, and the, the problem that I've seen with Twitter up until now is I've seen people that I... Um, respect and myself has also been censored for attacking an idea that was not that was a government idea and um, whereas I, when I was attacking that idea I got banned whereas I had people attacking me as the individual and trying to undermine me with loads of death threats and hate and they all just went on to live another day but because I was anti-lockdown or anti-vax mandate or something or anti-mask then I would be the one that's getting censored and getting deleted off platforms Mm. and uh, so that is very much censorship that i think elon is trying to trying to fix but i think we'd get to the truth if we were able to actually um have a censorship free platform we'd, so would we'd... the truth come out Let, let's say for example you know we've got the war in ukraine and we were talking about it before uh, again offline where the the, I think it was the spokesperson for Vladimir Putin was saying, no, well, it's all deep fakes, it's just fake. What really happened is the it was the Ukrainians that planted those bodies there. And, you know, this uh, special mission operation is going fantastic. And this was always the plan. And, you know, we're good and they're bad. Do you think we'd ever get to the truth with free speech? We'd get closer. At, l- at least the people speaking the truth would get heard. It, the issue that I would still see is the the governments at the moment have infinite money, have a lot of power, a lot of people, uh, so they can they can post a lot of shit. And um, and I've mm. seen that. So it's, it's basically called brigading. And um, so I've seen brigading happening on the Donald Trump Reddit, Joe Rogan's Reddit, um, anywhere where the truth is being talked about a lot. And at, yeah. when I say truth, I basically just mean like people are speaking freely and not just or an, an alternative idea to the favoritism idea or the favorite yeah. idea. Yeah, it seems much more based on like genuine curiosity as opposed to yes, my side's better than your side. I, I the second anyone starts doing that, I just switch off. You know, even if it is technically you know someone I agree with, if they just go yeah, yeah, and that's why the left is stupid. I'm like, no, it's just. Like you're all stupid for even believing in left and right. In reality, you're all just believing in government narratives, one or the other. But I've seen it in the Joe Rogan sub hugely over the last two years. That sub um, on Reddit used to be great. It used to be really funny, full of memes, full of interesting content, very much like Joe's podcast. And over the last two years, it's been brigaded by a load of people. And I don't believe they are there for free. I believe they are being paid to just post and post and post and upvote each other's comments and posts and downvote everybody else's so now it is just a political mire of dirt where they're constantly bringing the conversation back to politics back to the vaccine it's not it's always serious debate not fun and um Mm. and and anything funny that tries to get voted it's always anti-joe rogan they're trying to make fun of him and it's a meme that um, slags him off and look, we used to do that a fair bit anyway but it was balanced with we love joe but we'll take the piss out of him here like you know like mates yeah it isn't, it isn't matey this is just trying to discredit him it's very obvious and um it's just full of it and they basically just filled the sub so I, I fully expect even if we had a censorship free platform the governments in power right now would employ thousands and thousands about tens of thousands of bots and people 
just to continually post and harass and just try and get their narrative over. And a lot of people that obviously aren't paid to do it, you just get yeah. up to a certain extent, you get exhausted, right? You can only argue against one person if every comment you get gets 20 downvotes and every comment against you gets plus 200. It's kind of demoralizing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I think that would happen, but I think we would win. In the long run, we would win because they can't they can't maintain it forever. But um, right. I don't think we get that with with Twitter with Elon just yet. But I think maybe we get Twitter for a bit longer. I think at the moment it's a matter of time till Twitter becomes useless and we have to leave. So I think if Elon was to buy it, then we would we would keep it for longer. I think the, the censorship would would continue to happen, but at a slower rate because he would try and stop it. Were people more on Reddit before? So before Twitter, was it Reddit, in your opinion, in terms from a Bitcoin community stance? Like, how were people discussing it? Because I'll tell you one thing that I, I found out, it, well, it kind of came to me as a revelation this week, is I kind of like to listen to all these interviews and, of course, check Twitter, because I actually believe it. So I, I had quite a bit of money uh, just sat around, and I didn't know what to do with it but I wasn't frivolously spending it. This was early 2016. And I think if I'd have known what I knew now, I'd probably be all in on Bitcoin and be on a yacht somewhere, <laughs> right? So uh, so I don't want to miss that opportunity again. So I'm listening to, in a way, find out what is the latest thing, but not in a gambling sense of, oh, I'm going to put all my money into whatever the latest thing is because naturally like the NFTs have come out. That's seen as the latest thing, but I haven't ran off and thought, right, yeah, I'm going to make a quick buck off that. It's just more to be closer to the pools because I may have said to you, it's like, where was I? Like, you know, like where, this whole Bitcoin thing, like I knew about it, but I just didn't act. I didn't do anything about it. And I just kind of sat there and, Anyway, I still keep myself to this day, but then I don't because I'm in and it's still super early. But, you know, if, if Twitter dies and Reddit's still there, but Reddit is kind of obviously censored because you can easily get your strikes on Reddit, you know, Twitter, you get your strikes and you're out and you're gone, you're deplatformed from there. Where are Bitcoiners going to talk? Mm. At the moment, there isn't a viable alternative right now. The, the, there's various platforms that we could move to, but until Twitter becomes... Like completely... a Discord or something like that? Potentially, yeah. It's just too much of a, a chat. It's the same, is it? Yeah, it could be, though, yeah. But even Discord, I think that they've had censorship. It's pretty much, if it's centralised, the censorship's going to follow. We know it is. So we, we need a decentralised alternative. Um mm. It's, it's going to be interesting to watch how it plays out because I think they're going to continue to get more aggressive. And yeah. the, the problem with what Elon said, right, was that he will follow the free speech laws of each country, which which sounds reasonable. But mm. the problem is that it's very easy just to keep amending what hate speech he includes, right? And yeah. I, I've seen it on YouTube and on Spotify. It is a they count in their misinformation category, which. And that also can count, count as that is not legal to say now, like passing on this type of information is therefore a criminal offence and against free speech is talking about the pandemic and the vaccine. If you allude to the vaccine being either dangerous or lockdowns being ineffective or COVID not being a real pandemic, then that is classed as misinformation for just saying that and you will be removed off all the platforms with no no, no um, right to appeal. It. It's just yeah, categorically okay. one strike and you're done. So it's very easy for governments just to take what they've done. They, they've been very smart up until this point and go, don't put it into the free speech law. Mm. Instead, we don't need to put it there. We'll push it down into Twitter, into Spotify and into YouTube because that's where everyone can hear someone saying anything anyway. We don't care if you're saying this in your own private home because yeah. everyone in your home is probably going to think the same anyway and have the same opinions. We can't change those. And you're not going to get report each other. But what where the, these opinions can really get amplified is on these social media platforms. So they've edited free speech right. there. So if Elon can get in and remove it, it will force them to go, right, we need to build it in at the free speech level. And it'd be very obvious then that you do not have free speech because you now have a set of things that are illegal to deny. 
and you have to agree just because the government says so. And if you don't, there'd be punishments. So I'd like to see the government be pushed into a corner after do that, which... That so with that said, and knowing the power of Twitter, it kind of makes me feel like there's a very, very strong chance that Elon won't be able to buy Twitter. Yeah, yeah. But they've already, there's some poison pill. Have you seen this? Some, no. there's, there's some poison pill that they can essentially deploy and the board have deployed it. And essentially what it means is that once you own over 15% of Twitter, every single time um, you want to buy more shares, they get exponentially more expensive. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's to stop a hostile takeover ever happening. And yes. they can choose to deploy it or not. And essentially they, they, they've said they've deployed it, which basically blocks Elon from ever buying more than 15%. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, they, they, they don't want him. It's um, yeah, they, they know it's exactly. happening, is it? in, in, even in his takeaway or his takeover message to the SEC, it said in it, he has no confidence in the board management and hence he wants to take it over. And you're like, dude, I, I, I know that's obviously is what you think and it's clay, clay on your intention, but it's those guys you just slated that have to sign off on the approval of you. Buying correct, it. correct. So for every day that we delay, you know, it means that we stay in our jobs and you don't get what you actually want because the minute you do, our jobs are up and we're capiche. Yeah, and they're just rent seekers, right? They're just there. They're, they're, <laughs> you know, and, and, and Jack Jack Dorsey's been very vocal online, also saying that the board are the biggest problem. Jack's only a man since he left Twitter. Yeah, he's, he's finally yeah, started right. to speak out, isn't he? He, he actually yeah. spoke out against the board and someone replied to him going, are you allowed to say this? And he's replied with, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, but you just said it. I know. Yeah. I'm not allowed to say that. The board yeah. is dysfunctional and the biggest problem with Twitter. Because basically they block everything and they, mm. they're, they're the yeah. reason for the censorship. Because guess what? These are all government plants that yeah, have no intention to improve Twitter. They are there to control Twitter, not improve it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, as always, watch this space because we will be covering, uh, you know, Elon's a, a regular guest on the 4Bs, so I'm sure he will be making a return back very soon with regards to this story. Um, the next story that we've got is Hack of the Week, and uh, a guy who's done a security system steals $600,000 from a Trezor account. He found the password too. Do you want to... Uh, Explain a little bit more about this. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's a really disgusting one. This, so you know, obviously, there's there's been a an elderly lady who had six hundred grand in in cryptocurrency. I'm, I'm gonna pretend it's all in Bitcoin. So she's got six hundred grand in Bitcoin. And um, <laughs> we're gonna pretend grandma put it on in Bitcoin. If this grandma has six hundred grand in Dink Doink or something, then Jesus <laughs> Christ. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so she's obviously wanted to upgrade her security, make sure her house is more secure. So she's paying yeah. security cameras around the house. And this piece of shit, who happens to work for the insurance and the security company, finds a ledger. And also, unfortunately, this is again down to your own personal security. She obviously had some layer of security because she was installing cameras, but she had the password to her ledger um, or to her treasure in this instance next to it. So he pocketed it. <laughs> uh, took it away and um, stole all the money off it and um, the story is basically going through the courts now but he's been arrested he's been charged with it but he's posted his bail he's pasted 60 grand worth of bail he's out so this old lady still was 600 grand down who knows how yeah. much he still has you can, we can see that he's transferred it out to various wallets I think they verified um, that these wallets are his again Whenever people think, oh, no, I can just transfer out of this ledger into my own ledger. Yeah. Does your ledger come well, and yeah. have Bitcoin or whatever in it from a KYC exchange? Because it's very, very easy to track a couple of hops in. And so this guy got caught predominantly on the fact that he was the only guy probably to be in this lady's house and the money all goes missing. But then also <laughs> they verified where the crypto was, was his wallet as well. Yeah. But um. Yeah, it's, it, this is one of the, I always think about this, I get very paranoid about whenever I buy a security type equipment, that the biggest risk is sending it to your house from a company, because 
if you think like a criminal mm. where would you go work like i would go work an admin type role with some kind of access to the phones and their customer database in a security company and just write down a load of addresses and go these are the guys that have got stuff that are worth stealing yeah yeah and you've got first-hand knowledge and information there to hand you don't necessarily need to get your self dirty or your hands dirty but you can pass that information on for a lot of money and still be still be nice and say well it's nothing to do with me prove it exactly yeah and it's yeah i, I always thought like with safes especially um because then all these safes have overrides and stuff and they all they all get trained in how to open them so mm. like when you're putting a safe in and sometimes they're you know i, I make a point of going oh, this isn't for me. I'm giving this to my dad and da-da-da. And <laughs> I just dumb it down just so the guy that comes yeah. in that delivers it doesn't think it's mine or whatever. It's just, it's just weird. I, I'm, I'm very, very nervous on this. And this type of thing just gives me, gives me shills because I'm like, oh, God. You know, and this, again, I think you know, I'm going to buy some cameras and stuff for my new house. And like, this is just gone. I'm doing it myself. Like, I don't know how hard it's going to be. It. I'm just going to do it. I just, I'll figure it out because yeah, I didn't trust these guys, man. It's just, these are going to be the guys that are basically using it to sneak around your house. But I think in reality, I probably will get some professional help, but just any kind of backup security you have, whether it be ledgers, treasures, backup words, passcodes or whatever, they need to be securely hidden at all yeah. times. I like, don't trust. Because the thing is, this lady, obviously, it's in a drawer. Right? He's managed to find it. He, he, he got a bit of an inkling, didn't he? He's, he's having a little bit of a snoop and he knows exactly what he, what he found. He is a... He's a crypto guy himself. He's a Bitcoiner. So he knew exactly what he'd found. He knew exactly what code to look for. He found the two, bang, walked off a 600. If people are scared that they lose or forget where they, you know, like, yeah, I've put it somewhere so secure, it's too secure that I've forgotten where I've actually put it. Yeah. Even you can back, you know. the wall. Yeah. Who knows? It might be gone forever. You might have spent it. Yeah. And the problem is you can't make him give it back, right? It's um, one of those weird things where if he chooses just to do the time, he can choose to do the time. Yeah. Um, it's like a bank account, to huddle. You can't seize the money. You know? it's, 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 yeah. it's one of his hardware wallets. He's probably hidden it much smarter than she's hidden hers. So he will have, they will have to make him cooperate to give the money over. And um, he might yeah. just go, you know what, what's the time? It's like, oh, seven years or something. He's like, fine, I'll do seven years for 600 grand. Especially by yeah. the time I get out, it might be 60 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got 60 grand, 600 grand of Bitcoin there. Yeah, that could be 10. I woke up in this new Ferrari. Man, you could, buy, you could buy Ferrari. Yeah. If, um, if, he, if he goes to prison. And how good, <laughs> we've seen this happen before, haven't we? We've seen people steal Bitcoin, yeah. hide it, then go to prison for 10, 15 years. And it's the best way of hodling ever. <laughs> yeah. You come out after your 10, 15 year sentence, a millionaire. There's no way you'd have held it for that long. They're, most of them are degenerates. They'd have spent it on drugs and cars and women or whatever. But they, they were put in prison for 15 years. It's a 15 year hodl. They came out and they're freaking, they're very wealthy now. So <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen to this guy because he doesn't deserve it. He stole it. But... Yeah. But, um, our next story about Freddo's. Yeah, so um, I, I know we've spoken about Freddo bars before, but uh, I, I, I just thought it was amazing that this article explains it super, super easy in terms of uh, how the cost of a Freddo has changed since the year 2000. So it's a, it's a thread talking about exactly that. Um, you know, Freddo bars, for anyone that's uh, listening from overseas, are a chocolate bar here in the UK. Uh, it's like a popular kids chocolate bar. It started off, uh, to my knowledge, as 10 pence, you know? Uh, so yeah, yeah, 10p. So at the time, uh, 10 pence was absolutely nothing but bought you everything and got you anything, uh, you know, from penny sweets to your Freddo bars. And then if now, you are trying to purchase the same Freddo bar, not actually going to come out with a lot of change in the same way that you used to. And so 
very similar story in terms of your purchasing power has gone down massively since the time of when, again, you or I were kids. But uh, I'm just trying to remember, what was our end price now? Uh, can you remember this calling of what a Fredo bar is now? Yeah, I think I think it's uh, like 30, it's between like 27 and 30p. Yeah, yeah. It's weird as well because they've. I, I don't. I actually do think I got a bit of a conspiracy theory around Fredos, where I think they became the de facto way of tracking inflation. <laughs> yes, I would not be surprised if because basically the, in from the beginning of two thousand they went from like five to ten p all the way up to thirty p in twenty seventeen, but then since twenty seventeen to twenty twenty two, they've dropped. I think down to like 15p, then up to 17. So they've gone down quite significantly. And I just think, has something dodgy happened here where the government have gone, hold on, like Cadbury's, everyone's tracking the fucking price of a Freddo. So what we will do is give you some tax breaks over here worth yeah. hundreds of billions. You, but on the condition, you lower the price of Freddo's by like 1p a year. And then all these dickheads that are tracking the price of Frados to like prove inflation is a certain thing, it's going to ruin all their models. <laughs> and um, because it has, it doesn't track inflation anymore. It's it no. down in price. I'm like, but, but whether you track any other item like tra- from, from Cadbury's or something, like track a Mars bar or a Snickers or whatever, they've, they've continued to skyrocket. And then not only have they skyrocketed in, in price, they've also done the shrinkflation where you get less in the chocolate bar as well. Like you get right. 20% less chocolate plus the price is like 50 or 100% more over the last 20 years. And you go, right, that tracks inflation pretty closely. That's that's more like it, you know, pretty much more than double the price and you're getting 20% less. Yeah, you go, that's the type of thing I believe. This thing kind of breaks about five years ago. So I literally, I only saw you have added this story. I started Googling around trying to find like Cadbury's tax breaks 2017. <laughs> I'm still going to keep digging. I want to find if I. There's find, a reason why, isn't there? Because I don't. Well, like Cabri just must have accepted that. Like fuck it, we'll we'll take a loss on it because they must be. I've seen definitely uh, in terms of what we call shrinkflation happening with the zero coffee, and so I've seen various different prices. On average, you can buy a pot of a zero coffee for three quid and uh but in times of where there are no offers it goes up to 590 595 six quid however they are now trying to present the three quid tin uh which is 100 grams as a as a 90 gram tin which is now the new standard but still for three quid so there is definite shrinkflation in the fact that there's 10 percent less but you're still expected to pay the three quid mark but on but sometimes they have a offer on where the bigger tin of like 150 grams will be only four quid so the you kind of know well you can do that that for four quid so really that's the probably the closer to the truth and the the right price but People aren't really watching or seeing this because normally uh, shrinkflation happens and you can't compare the old and the new in real time together. You just look at certain boxes or uh, packaging and you think, am I getting older or is this getting smaller? Whereas, uh, as you can see in real time with this uh, current example. Yeah, because in in reality, if you just want to cut all the bullshit, you just go. Let's just look at the monetary supply. Look at look at look how many pounds are there and how many dollars are there, and track that over the last 50, 60 years. There's your answer. And yeah, it's 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 very much you know. You know if, if there's more money out there, it means your money's worth less. It it, it has to because there's more of it now. You know they've devalued your money. It was the scarcity is a thing. If you've got ten of a thing, they're worth one thing. If you've got a hundred of a thing, they're worth less. So it's um. Yeah, so if, if you've got all these pounds, and, and as we know, you know, we've trapped the value of the dollar and the pound over the last 100 years, they're all basically at zero already. It's like 99.7% of the value of the pound and the dollar is already gone. So it's it's almost 
you know, I, I find it a little bit cute that people try and use the Fredo example. It's trying to dumb it down for the masses. But fundamentally, as all analogies, like if you really go far enough into it, it breaks because there's some form of manipulation. It doesn't quite work, which is why you just go, you know what, let's just cut the analogy to sometimes and go, just look at the money supply. <laughs> yeah. Look at the total money and then then tell me that that doesn't look fucking scary. <laughs> like, like the, the chart <laughs> is just hockey sticking up in the last two years and it has been hockey sticking up faster and faster since 1971. And um, yeah, so any government or economist that goes online and tries to say, this is fake and inflation is not a thing. Like, dude, dude. Well, it is not fake. It's here. It's real. Yeah. It's happening. And despite all that, and um, well, I think actually, I would actually probably blame partly inflation for the fact that we have this last story around NFTs because I think people are desperate. They're just trying to, to make their money, right? And, um, so we've got this shitcoin knobhead who brought Jack Dorsey's first tweet. I think to be fair to Jack Dorsey, he was experimenting, you know, just as we've said, you know, NFTs, like maybe you do a bit of experimentation. I think he did experiment. He's, he's now regressed on this experiment, but his first ever tweet, he offered it up as an NFT where he said, you know, just trying Twitter or something. Yeah, uh, it was his first ever tweet, essentially the first ever tweet on the entire platform. And um, this one guy bought that the NFT of that tweet for $2.9 million last year. And uh, he then listed it. He wanted <laughs> to make some profit. It's a year later. NFTs have boomed. It's like, you know, maybe it's the top of the market. He tried to sell it for $48 million. And um, little to his surprise, um, and mine, the top bid was um about two hundred and eighty dollars <laughs> yeah uh, i was like is this real like did, were people just in bed after a long weekend over the easter and had the hangovers and just kind of missed the missed the auction was it less because one thing that we know about <laughs> people in the space They've got money. They've got money to burn. So uh, to see 280. Yeah, it's stupidly low, isn't it? And, um, oh, I don't know if you, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I made a different idea. Yeah. My, my internet connection keeps coming and going. We will go to get back. You're doing better than Miss uh, Mrs. No Show. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Move back. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I think it might come back just then. So I've just clicked on the link actually again. So it was $280 when this article was written, but now there's a bid of 10.3 ETH, which according to this is $31,800. So the bid's gone up quite substantially, but still, he bought it for 2.9 million. He's got a 31 grand bid here. And, and like you just said, normally when something this embarrassing happens, he, this guy's obviously wealthy, right? He bought a tweet for th three million. You would just bid a million of your own money and buy it off yourself. Like, why not? Yeah. Like, you pay the gas fees. It's only going to be a hundred dollars or whatever to, to to exchange it, just to move it from one wallet to another. Do, do a little bit of shell bidding and maybe get two people to bid on it, to bid it up, to get it up to a decent price so that you're not embarrassed that it's only going for, well, what is now 10 ETH or, you know, previously at 280. You know, you want to drum up a little bit more interest to, to kind of really spark the fact that this is the very first tweet on the platform. Yeah, I think in reality, what this really does expose is, I don't think there's anywhere near as much money in NFTs is what they say. Mm. A lot of this is it just exposes that people are just buying NFTs off themselves. It's just shit coiners that are already wealthy. They buy up the majority and then a stupid celebrity gets suckered in to buying like the final one or the, you know, so in reality, I'd say of a collection of a hundred, I would guess that like 90 are brought up by insiders and the final 10, they're, they're brought up by real people, but they're the marks. 
and there's no one's ever going to buy their 10 because mm. the, it's like the other 90 are the ones that didn't really get paid for right so i mean this just exposes because i remember when these tweets came out they were all going for silly money i was thinking is this real like what's going on and this guy looks like he forgot to do the little scamming bit where you bid up your own thing and make it just get it off yeah. zero right just get get a couple of mates to put in some realistic bids just to bump it up to what the half million mark and then hopefully yeah. let some celebrity be a moron and end up buying it for a million and he thinks he's made he's made off with a, a cheap nft but he paid a million dollars for a picture of jack's first tweet whereas in reality you know this guy who knows if he actually paid for it i don't know where the money went but um mm. yeah it's just more garbage but um it's good to see that it looks like the nft thing is all cooling off quite a bit now when because like you said you know uh, a genuine picture of jack's first tweet and authorized by jack himself you know he he put this up uh it, you know that's a little bit like a signature or you know, it, it does have some value. I could actually see this as being a little bit of a valuable item. Okay. And Jack obviously has only raised in prominence in Bitcoin since this time. And uh, and yeah, for literally for no one to bid it above a thousand dollars for like the first week, it's now at thirty one. But I would imagine because he's got so much press, he's probably just put in a couple of bids himself. I would imagine that what. So I mean, tw- yeah, Twitter's. <laughs> Twitter is a platform again to uh, to Bitcoiners and to people in the industry as like the place to be. So to own a piece of this kind of makes you be, think, right, fantastic. I, I want to be that person that owns it. I want to be that. But then I also think, is this exposing the non-use case of what an NFT actually is? Like, fantastic. Yeah. Great. It's a picture of Jack's first tweet, so what? But I just think that with all of the JPEGs, so what? Like, uh, yes, I mean, it's like art, isn't it? You know, I always, well, let's use the picture, the uh, the analogy of the Mona Lisa. Fantastic, it's the Mona Lisa. It, it's got fantastic looks and so on, but doesn't really appeal to me. So why is this tweet or a picture, a digital picture going to appeal to me? It, it just doesn't, it doesn't move me in any way. Yeah. I, I think probably one of the things that devalued this tweet was, I think Jack was a little bit getting into crypto and NFTs a year ago, and then he proper got orange pilled. And now mm. he's 100% like a toxic big sort of Bitcoin maxi. <laughs> All these NFT guys have seen this tweet and gone, I don't want tweet from some bitcoin maxi even if it is the yeah. very first tweet ever on twitter which clearly has providence right that is something yeah. that is is the equivalent of like a mona lisa like there's only one of them and it definitely is the original this is definitely the original tweet it is by the founder he says it is so this has all the providence but because he's a bitcoin maxi they're gone i don't want to touch it <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and obviously no bitcoiner is even slightly stupid enough to go i want it either because it's like if I want a picture of Jack's first tweet, then I'll print it out. Like, like what? I don't need yeah, to buy exactly. it for three million dollars. What? I'm not a moron. I'll print it out, and I don't need it because, yeah, it's so easily accessible. I just right click, and I've got it too. Exactly, man. So, uh, right. On that, well, that that is it. That is it for us here. So that is pod 51 from the four Bs. He's been Mr. All In, a.k.a. the Trillion Dollar Man. I am Sir Never Look, a.k.a. the Excellence of Execution. Please do continue to, uh, to listen, subscribe. Next time we will be back with the people's champ himself. Yes, Dr. Evil 10%. And who knows, on our year anniversary, Mrs. No Show may show. Who knows? I doubt it. Nah, nah, I doubt <laughs> it either. I doubt it. She won't. <laughs>